Okay, so in today's class, uh, let us continue our discussion of uh, creation and annihilation operators in many particle condensed matter systems. So that means, uh, uh, you see in the earlier classes, uh, we had uh, seen how creation and annihilation operators are very useful in studying excitations of uh, systems with finite number of degrees of freedom or even uh, in the case of say a crystalline solid uh, like in one dimension you had an infinitely many degrees of freedoms but then uh, the point is that uh, the uh, the masses and uh, the masses involved in that system are fixed in number but it's the excitations that uh, are varying in number so we could study excitations of such systems through creation and annihilation operators very conveniently and a very similar approach was useful also in the study of uh, the quantum nature of the electromagnetic field because the excitations of the electromagnetic field when studied quantum mechanically uh, result in this very important notion of photons and photons are very critical in understanding a very important phenomenon uh, which perplexed uh, most of the physics community in the early part of the 20th century, namely the photoelectric effect. S but however, um, the utility of the creation and annihilation operator method is not limited to the study of excitations. Uh, it is also very useful in studying a more general class of systems uh, where uh, not only the uh, excitations are can be created and annihilated, but the particles themselves are now viewed as excitations of some vacuum. So, that is typical in relativistic field theories as especially the Dirac theory of the electron where the vacuum is uh, not just empty in the sense of being absolutely devoid of any dynamics, but rather it is uh, it's an infinite reservoir of negative energy particles so if you pump enough energy into vacuum the energy is swallowed by the vacuum and it uh, generates uh, particles and antiparticles so in that sense uh, it's very important to learn how to study uh, uh, how to create and annihilate material particles not only excitations because material particles also in this modern way of thinking are merely excitations of uh, some other field. Okay, uh, with that preamble I had uh, started off uh, explaining to you the mathematical definitions of uh, the annihilation operator specifically and also the creation operator. So, I had reached up to this point where I had told you that in order to define uh, the annihilation operator you first introduce a concept called a symmetrization operator which ensures that the uh, wave function of many particles which may not necessarily be properly symmetrized is first properly symmetrized and then it is then acted upon by an annihilation operator which annihilates a coordinate rather than a particle. So, specifically this, uh, this operator called A of R is preferentially annihilates the last coordinate it finds in the wave function and because it is uh, biased towards the last coordinate it is very important to first properly symmetrize the wave function so that every coordinate uh, then gets an opportunity to be that last coordinate because the symmetrization ensures that there is a linear combination of terms where that last coordinate is successively replaced by a different one in each term. So, uh, so point is that you could go ahead and define the uh, annihilation operator uh, in this way, but then this annihilates the last coordinate. So, similarly, um, you have a creation and operator which uh, creates an additional coordinate which was not there earlier. So, imagine you have a system of n particles. So, it depends upon n coordinates R1, R2 up to Rn, but then you also create one more coordinate called Rn plus 1. Uh, so, that Rn plus 1, this coordinate was not there earlier. So, but then you are creating it through this. So, that is uh, that amounts to creating a new particle at position Rn plus 1. 
but then uh, remember that we are it's still not a bona fide particle in the sense that it, uh, it uh, right now it's merely creating a chord in it in order to create a particle we have to ensure that the wave function that is finally obtained is again properly symmetrized uh, properly symmetrized means it could be fully symmetric under uh, pairwise exchange which would uh, correspond to bosons or it could be fully anti-symmetric under pairwise exchange which would correspond to fermions. So, the way to accomplish that I already explained to you in the last class is to sandwich this operator which annihilates a coordinate between the symmetrization uh, between two symmetrization operators. Um, so, symmetrization means symmetrization or anti-symmetrization as the case may be. So, uh, by doing this you see uh, you are ensuring that before you annihilate you first properly uh, symmetrize the wave function so that every coordinate gets an opportunity to be the last one and then finally this annihilation operator annihilates the last coordinate and having annihilated the last coordinate again the wave function is not guaranteed to be properly symmetric. So, you again anti symmetrize or symmetrize uh, as the case may be and then you uh, get back a wave function which has one fewer particle, but still represents the same class of uh, particles whether they are bosons or fermions as they were uh, to start with. So, that is the whole point of uh, this method of defining uh, annihilation operators. So, um, similarly with creation operators also we have to uh, uh, you know first, uh, so imagine suppose you have or you already have a, a symmetrized wave function. So, if you already have a symmetrized wave function things are much simpler. So, if it is already properly symmetrized you, you do not have to again you, you could again symmetrize, but you will get back the same result. So, you see the, uh, the so this is a operator that annihilates a particle. So, the, the relation between an operator that annihilates a particle which is called C of r and an operator that annihilates a coordinate is basically that the two are related through this formula 8.61 where you sandwich the uh, operator that annihilates a coordinate between two operators that annihilate that symmetrize uh, the wave function. But then if it is already symmetrized properly to begin with then you do not need to further symmetrize you simply annihilate the last one because then the last one annihilating the last one uh, does not mean that you are you know preferentially you are giving a bias towards the last one because then you see the all the wave functions have you know the, the properly symmetrized uh, wave function has already taken care of the fact that the remaining one. So, the remaining coordinates will be properly symmetric or anti-symmetric uh, as it was earlier. Okay, so, that is the reason why if you start off with a properly symmetrized wave function you are in luck because you do not have to struggle too hard while defining the annihilation operator. So, similarly while defining the creation operator uh, you end up doing this. Uh, so, the creation operator is a little bit harder because you see once you create a particle at position r n plus 1 then of course, you are uh, maximally spoiling the symmetry because you see the wave function is symmetric under the exchange of any two coordinates. So, long as those two coordinates are in that you know starting set from r 1, r 2 all the way up to r n only. So, but then on the other hand you have now created a new coordinate called r n plus 1. Now, that is no longer guaranteed to be properly um, symmetric or anti-symmetric uh, with respect to the remaining ones. So, that means if you are exchange R 1 with R 2 or R n you are going to get the right answer, but if you uh, interchange R 1 with R n plus 1 which has now been added uh, that is no longer guaranteed to be properly symmetric unless you do what, what 8.63. Uh, suggest to you namely that it, it uh, democratically interchanges uh, r n plus 1 through permutations with all the remaining coordinates. So, it is it kind of uh, it permutes over all the permutations of uh, 1, 2, 3 up to r n plus 1 and uh, it makes sure that the proper signs are being counted. So, if, if you are talking about fermions 
you have to make sure that you put a minus sign every time the permutation is odd and a plus sign every time the permutation is even. So, when you do that, uh, you are guaranteed to, uh, so if you start off with a system of n fermions, for example, and then you create a fermion at position r, you are guaranteed to end up with a wave function that corresponds to, you know, a particle that is, I mean, you are guaranteed to find yourself with a system with one more particle where one of the fermions is at r which is what you want. So, uh, you know just to be concrete, uh, so this may look a uh, little formidable, but uh, it will look easier to understand if you specialize to a specific value of the number of particles. So, if you select capital N to be 2 for example, which means your starting number of particles uh, had 2 particles in it and then you create one more particle, right. So, you end up with uh, you know a wave function that looks like this. So, uh, so this is uh, perfectly uh, symmetric or uh, I mean I am talking about say bosons here, uh, let us see, uh, yeah I am, I'm, I think I am specializing to S, S equal to plus 1 here. So, if it is bosons then you can see uh, clearly see that uh, you know if you interchange 1 and 2, uh, you get back uh, what you are looking for. But if you interchange say 1 and 3, right, so, uh, so this becomes 3 and this becomes 1 and this becomes uh, 1 and this becomes 3 and this becomes 1, this becomes 3, okay. So, yeah, this is uh, in general, not necessarily for a sequence 1 because you see if you interchange 1 and 3, what is going to happen is that this will become uh, psi s r 3 r 2, right. So, r 3 r 2 is basically s times r 2 r 3. So, it, it will become, so this, this term will become s times this term and this delta function will become this delta function. So, that this entire term will become s times this, this function, right. And uh, this will become s times, uh, so R, R3, R1 will go to R1, R3, but then R, psi of R1, R3 is same as S times psi of R3, R1. So, it again becomes S of itself. So, finally, if you interchange say 1 and 3, you get the same wave function multiplied by S. So, the interchange of any two of them, any two coordinates is basically S times itself. I mean S times the original wave function. So, so therefore, this is a correct uh, way of creating a particle, a new particle at R. It is been created at R obviously because you see it is democratically. So, R is the position at which a fermion or boson has been created, but then you see uh, every coordinate here has an opportunity to sit at R. So, in this term R1 has that opportunity to sit at R here R2 has the opportunity to sit at R and here it is R3 has that opportunity. So, so this way of doing things uh, you know democratizes uh, how the uh, creation operator acts on the wave functions. Okay, so, uh, so now uh, with this sort of a machinery we can go ahead and prove certain important theorems that are going to be useful later on. And that is uh, for example, the first theorem that I am going to prove is that uh, the uh, first I am going to define this S commutator. So, that means that if S is plus 1 is the usual commutator describing bosons. So, that means if S is plus 1, uh, then A commutator B subscript plus 1 means uh, A B minus B A. See, however, if S is minus 1, A commutator B with subscript minus 1 is A B plus B A. So, that is called the anti commutator. So, that is that is of importance when you are uh, studying fermions. So, when S is plus 1 uh, this uh, this uh, this definition corresponds to the usual commutator, but if S is minus 1 it corresponds to an anti commutator. So, the anti commutator of A and B is A B plus B A. Okay, so, uh, the point is that I am going to be uh, now 
I am going to now prove that the uh, commutator or anti commutator as the case may be of two C's at two different uh, positions is always 0. Okay. However, C and its adjoint so that means the so the two annihilation operators will always properly commute properly commute means either the commutator is 0 if it is bosons and anti commutator is 0 if it is fermions. So, that is why that is what I mean by properly commute. So, the word commute actually means travel you see you commute from your home to work. So, commutator means it is a device that tells an operator how to travel across another operator. So, that is what commutator means. So, commutator is a uh, is a device that uh, or it is it's a prescription uh, that uh, pins down you know how an operator what rules an operator has to obey in order to travel across another operator. So, that is why it is called commutator. So, the point is that uh, the commutator of C and C uh, I mean the, the commutator of two annihilation operators is going to be 0. So, I am going to prove this. So, I am going to prove that the S commutator of uh, the two annihilation operators is 0 whereas, the S commutator of uh, C and the, uh, the annihilation and the creation operators is basically the Dirac delta function. So, how do you prove this? So, this is very crucial this is one of the central ideas uh, in I mean this is one of the central relations that uh, are going to be re repeatedly used in all the calculations that you are going to do using creation and annihilation operators in many body physics. So, how do you uh, prove this? So, uh, of course, uh, you see these are uh, uh, these operators act on uh, many body wave functions. So, you should imagine that there is a many body wave function and as usual I am going to assume that it is properly S symmetrized. So, that means it is uh, either properly symmetric or properly anti symmetric and then now I am going to act this uh, operator which acts is supposed to act on n particle wave functions and clearly there are two annihilations. So, I am going to be uh, you know eliminating two coordinates from this wave function. So, clearly I should make sure that uh, there are at least uh, two particles in my system because otherwise proving this is meaningless if there is less than two particles in the system this is trivially always correct. But to prove this I need to show that uh, regardless of how many particles there are this is always true. So, in other words I have to show this and this. Okay. So, how do I show uh, the first one? So, as usual I am going to uh, so, in in uh, this course I am uh, not going to be uh, very careful about uh, proving in the sense in which mathematicians prove things. I am going to prove by examples which is really not a proof at all because you see nobody is going to accept uh, examples as uh, substitutes for proofs. So, so these are not proofs they are plausibility arguments which I have wrongly characterized as proofs. But then uh, the point is that uh, you know as physicists uh, we have this uh, intuitive feeling for when things are going to work out properly. Uh, so, through maybe inductive reasoning we work out a few examples and uh, we do not expect any pathological exceptions. So, uh, many times uh, our intuition is correct and uh, when we work out a small number of uh, s examples and if things are ok, we uh, are completely justified in assuming that it is going to be ok in general. There are some rare exceptions even in physics, uh, but those are of interest only because there are they are exceptions rather than uh, the rule. So, uh, so that is also true even in mathematics that many times your intuition works perfectly fine, but when it does not work it actually becomes a research topic in itself that mathematicians make a big fuss about exceptions precisely because those are exceptions too. So, in other words that is where your intuition and guesswork fail. So, uh, for the most part I am not going to actually prove anything I am going to rather uh, use examples and then use inductive reasoning and uh, just claim that it is going to work. 
So if those of you are dissatisfied with my approach can of course uh, invite it to go ahead and prove it rigorously using the tools that they are comfortable with. In fact, that is a good idea to do it properly because you know it trains you in uh, logical thinking. And, but uh, the reason why I do not do it is because it is it's basically a lot of effort and as a, as a physicist I have better things to do in the sense of getting to the more difficult physics parts of the subject which are anyway going to be very hard in themselves. Alright, so, so now I start off with a simple example where there are only two particles in which case I start off with this wave function with two particles then I act it on this S commutator uh, with respect to R and R dash and now the question is uh, this is what the S commutator is. Now if I go ahead and uh, annihilate R dash so clearly it is going to be this and it is going to be that ok. So I mean I will allow you to at least work this out. This is going from here to here is something you should do it yourself. If you want me to even explain how to go from here to here that means you are not following anything. So it is important for you to do this yourself. So uh, this to this is obvious but this to this is less obvious but you should figure that out. So the point is that having reached here it is now obvious that this is same as S times so it is S, S times R, R dash but then S squared is always 1 because uh, S is either plus 1 or minus 1. So therefore this is just psi minus psi which is 0. So that concludes my plausibility argument now I am going to claim that it is valid for all n which is certainly no proof at all but it is uh, it's good enough for me you know my standards are very low. Okay, so uh, I am going to next prove that uh, the S commutator of the annihilation and the creation operators acting on psi gives back the same wave function multiplied by a Dirac delta function. So how do I prove that? Again here uh, I am going to start with the two particle wave functions just for simplicity. Now I create one more particle here, okay, so I create one more particle. So how do I create a particle? So uh, first I, I have to uh, rewrite this as uh, see first I, uh, yeah, I have skipped many steps going from here to here. Okay. See first I have to create a particle here. So what does that mean? So I have to do all the things I have been doing there. So that means I first multiply this by Dirac delta R1 minus R dash. Then I multiply by uh, you know r2 minus r dash but with an s because now I am doing the second one. So uh, r2 minus r dash so I have to do all that so I have skipped many steps ok. So here I first create then I annihilate. So here I first annihilate and then create. So when I do all that I end up with uh, this result ok. So, so this is the term I will get when I do this. So that means I first create and annihilate I get this whereas uh, this one, so this one I will get when I do this ok. So this is basically I am annihilating, uh, so, so I am annihilating then creating. So I am annihilating R1 and R2 and then creating one more particle. So anyway bottom line is that put together I am going to get this. So again I have skipped steps just like here I skipped the step from going from here to here which is uh, not obvious but not that difficult. But going from here to here is uh, somewhat less obvious. So you sh really should work this out. Using the definitions of C and C dagger I have already explained. This is how C behaves when it acts on uh, n particle wave function. This is how C dagger acts. So now that you know how C and C dagger acts you have to go ahead and evaluate all this on your own. Okay. So when you do that you will see that uh, terms cancel out in pairs. So for example this cancels with this and this cancels with uh, this because you see R1 comma R is S times R comma R1. So but S squared is 1 or alternatively uh, a psi S of R comma R1 is S times psi S of R1 comma R and those two will cancel out and uh, you get only end up with this. Okay and this is basically this. So in other words it is uh, so the 
the S commutator of uh, C and C dagger acting on the wave function of uh, two particles is the same wave function multiplied by delta of r minus r dash. Okay, so, uh, you can go ahead and uh, prove that in general for uh, many, many particles I have just indicated how you might uh, go about doing it for more than uh, two particles. So, uh, maybe you use some inductive reasoning. You know, it's it's not merely asserting that it works for two particles. Therefore, it had better work for all other, all other number of particles. I mean, we are not like demanding anything. So, but then uh, inductive proof means that you successively you assume uh, you first prove that it works for two, three, and then you assume it works for n, and then you prove that it also because it works for n particles then you go ahead and prove that it works for n plus 1 particle. So, that is called inductive reasoning. So, that is called mathematical induction which you must have learned in school at least I learned in school when I was studying mathematical induction. So, something like that has to be possibly employed here. So, I have given you some indications of how to do that uh, using cyclic permutations and so on and so forth. Okay, so, uh, now that uh, we have proved uh, the important commutation rules uh, obeyed by uh, the creation and annihilation operators, we are now perfectly equipped uh, to answer this uh, important uh, question uh, namely of what possible utility is uh, the introduction of uh, these operators going to be. In other words, why did we go ahead and introduce these operators? So, the reason is because uh, like I told you firstly uh, in relativistic systems you actually do create particles out of nothing namely uh, just have to pump energy into a vacuum and you create particle antiparticle pairs. But a very analogous uh, situation exists even in condensed matter. Uh, namely, uh, you know if you imagine a semiconductor uh, at a 0 temperature an undoped semiconductor you have this valence band that is perfectly fully filled and you have an empty conduction band. So, all these are filled and uh, so now if you uh, pump energy into the system there is going to be an uh, electron here and a hole is left behind. Okay, so, uh, so basically uh, what is going to happen is that, uh, so a hole is going to be left behind but there are all electrons here. So, so the uh, this is a hole and this is an electron. Okay, so actually you end up creating a particle and an antiparticle and this, uh, this hole actually is a is basically absence of an electron but that absence of an electron itself behaves like a particle and it is uh, it moves around the material as if it is a particle. Okay, so, the bottom line is that uh, you can in fact even in condensed matter create particles and uh, antiparticles out of nothing. So, which is the reason why you, you should learn how to uh, study a system of many particles where uh, the number of particles is not fixed where you can go ahead and create and annihilate. Okay, so, one of the important uh, physical quantities that are going to be of interest in our study of many particle system is what is called the one particle Green's function. So, uh, in this uh, in the remainder of this lecture I am going to just introduce this concept and in the next lectures I am going to study more of its properties. So, this is called the whole Green's function, uh, the whole Green's function. So, uh, Green has to be with capital G because Green is the name of a mathematician, uh, it is not the color Green, it is Green is the name of a individual. So, it is G is capital. and this is called the particle Green's function. So, what this does is, so why are we studying this, but let us first understand what this is. 
then you will understand immediately why we are studying it. So, the point is that what this whole Green's function concept is, is that imagine you start with some state. So, this, there is a state of n particles. So, there are n particles minding their own business. So, that means those n particles are in some quantum mechanical state called S. Now, what you do is uh, you come along and remove a particle at position R dash. So, that is what this C does, it annihilates or removes, it removes a particle at R dash at time T dash. So, when you remove a particle what you are doing is basically you are leaving behind a hole that means you are, you are creating a hole. So, you remove a particle you are, you are, you are leaving behind a void or a hole. So, now that hole is going to propagate in the system. So, what that means is basically that hole is going to be filled by other particles and those those particles that fill this void will themselves leave behind another hole. So, it will be as if that the hole itself is moving here and there. So, that is pretty much what is going to happen. So, now that hole is going to keep wandering off until you decide to finally put back the whatever you have taken away at position R at time T. So, you insert the particle you, that you had removed back into the system, but at a different position at a different uh, obviously later time. So, uh, so you insert it back into the system. So, now what is going to happen is that uh, you see when you removed a particle, you are basically disturbing the system uh, tremendously. So, uh, now the wave function uh, you see the system had n particles, now it has one fewer. So, when it had n particles it was properly anti-symmetrized, there was mutual, well it's either, it was either properly anti-symmetrized or symmetrized under the interchange of any two particles. But all of a sudden when you remove one particle there is one fewer particle. Now, the system has to scramble to again properly. Uh, symmetrize or anti-symmetrize itself. Now, what that means is basically that uh, once you remove a particle from the system, the state of the system is no longer going to be stationary. So, that means it, it would not be a stationary state in the sense of quantum mechanics. It is going to have dynamics, it is going to evolve. So, it is it's going to obey the time dependent Schrodinger equation, it is going to evolve according to that. So, now once it evolves according to the time dependent Schrodinger equation, uh, it will evolve until you again decide to further disturb the system by reinserting the particle that you had removed. So, namely you reinsert the particle at position R at time t. So, when you do that you end up with a system with the same number of particles you had when you started off with. So, you started off with n particles, now you end up with a system which also has n particles. Okay, so, now the question is now uh, it is completely meaningful to ask the following question. You see you started off with the state S. So, you removed a particle and then later on you reinserted a particle. Now, you have got a state with the same number of particles as you started off with in S. So, now the question is what is the overlap of this state? So, this state is what you obtain, what I have circled here is the state you obtain after doing this procedure of creating a hole and filling the hole with the particle again. So, you have the same number of particles. So, now you, you have created a completely new state. So, the question is now the valid question is what is the overlap between that state and the original state because you could ask many questions. Uh, in fact, you can ask the what is, I mean the obviously the most general question you can ask is what is this new state that itself is a valid question. But a more limited less ambitious question is what is the overlap, the quantum mechanical overlap between this state and the starting state. So, so that is a less ambitious, less uh, informative question, but it is a valid question to ask. And if you ask that question, the answer to that question is basically called the whole Green's function. So, it is the one particle whole Green's function. It is one particle because you are removing one particle and then replacing the same particle into the system. 
So, similarly you can create a, a you can imagine a particle Green's function where you have an n particle system S to begin with. Now, rather than removing a particle and creating a void, you insert a new particle of the same kind into the system. Now, you insert it at position R at time t and then you watch the system evolve because then it is as usual it is not going to be a stationary state because that new particle is going to again disturb the symmetry of the wave function it does a whole bunch of other things and uh, even if you see the point is that it is not as if uh, you know the new particle has to physically interact it with the other particle it is not as if say for example they all have to be charged particles if you insert them they will repel each other it's not like that. So, even if they are you know uh, inert towards the presence of the others uh, classically speaking, but quantum mechanically the mere fact that they are there as a collective system of particles uh, will force them to sense each other's presence in the sense that there is something called the st statistical interaction. So, that is the technical term that physicists use. What that means is there is some apparent interaction that comes about because of the need to properly symmetrize or anti symmetrize the wave function. So, the, the need to symmetrize or anti symmetrize the wave function creates an apparent effect of interaction. So, that means it uh, creates a effect as if there is an interaction between the particles. So, even though uh, classically there is none. So, this is a purely quantum mechanical effect the statistical interaction. So, you do have so as a result once you create one more particle you induce statistical interaction in the system and the system is no longer stationary and evolves according to the time dependent Schrodinger equation. So, it evolves up to a certain time until you then decide to remove another particle of its own kind because they are all perfectly indistinguishable you so you cannot really keep track of which particle you added. So, all the best you can do is simply remove another particle because they are all identical, but then you remove the, the other particle at position r dash at time t dash whereas, you inserted the original particle at position r at time t. So, having done all that uh, you end up with a new state. Now, that new state as usual is going to have the same number of particles that uh, you started off with namely n particles. So, in this particle grains function you first insert a particle which was not there at all from the outside and then you wait for some time and then you remove another particle of the same kind and then you end up with a new state and that new state has the same number of particles as s. So, now it makes perfect sense to ask the question what is the quantum mechanical overlap of this new state with the original state S. So, if this is the new state, so if this is your new state, so this is the particle Green's function. So, it makes perfect sense to ask what is this, ok. So, this is called the particle Green's function because you this is called particle because you first create a particle and then you annihilate it. So, that is called the particle Green's function it is defined with a greater subscript and for reasons that I will tell you later uh, is described by a less subscript when it is a whole Green's function ok. So, but uh, clearly in this uh, in this way of doing things there is an implication that I am working in the Heisenberg picture because you know that uh, in the Heisenberg picture uh, the operators are time dependent whereas, the states are time independent. So, uh, this, so there is the implication here that so I said uh, you create at time t. So, I have to explain to you what see I have not defined uh, c r t I have only defined c of r in my earlier see in all, all this earlier section I only successfully defined c of r and c dagger of r I have not told you what this means. So, this is completely unacceptable. So, I have to ex first explain to you what c of r comma t is. So, in other words I have to tell you how c of r uh, changes with time. So, that is going to be done using the Heisenberg's interpretation of uh, operators and their time dependence. 
which I am going to relegate to the next lecture. So, I hope you will join me to uh, understand these uh, ideas in the next lecture. So, see you next time. Thank you. Mm -hmm.